guys, welcome to this episode of the Trainer Feed. Today we have a um, fellow Equinox trainer, but more importantly, an animal flow master instructor, Freddy Satiza Bull, and he's based in the Miami area. But before we bring him in, let's see how we're both feeling. Angel, David? I'm good. Doing well, you know. Keep on keeping on. Good, you know. Hanging in there. Everything's good. I was at the gym early in the morning, got an early workout in. Good. Good stuff, guys. Good. What about yourself? Yeah, busy week, but it's good. I can't, I can't, I can't have any complaints. Cool. All right. How about Alfie? Fucking hard life of sleeping, eating, and repeat. No work. Is Alfie gonna stay nice. with? Is he gonna stay with you or? I think he's going to. Oh, okay. Cause her mom got a also got a friendship from Colombia two weeks ago. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's Big really, fight. really small. Well, they were a little scrappy at first. Not so much him. He was just being nice but the other one's a little like eh, territorial but uh they're they're a lot better now so it's a good time for them to bond and stuff so so it's good it's good sounds good all right shall we bring him in yeah let's bring him in hey freddy how's it going man hey what's up man how are you, how you doing nice to meet how's you. it going freddy i'm doing good i'm doing good so these are my, oh, sorry, you, these are my uh, my buddies, but these are also my co-trainers, uh, Angel and David, and then this is Freddie. So, um, what's up, guys? How's it going? We uh, we heard that you were a former Equinox trainer and then now uh, master instructor. I guess Jacques could intro you, or you can intro yourself. Sure, why, uh, Jacques? Why don't you take a stab at it, and I'll, I'll fill in the gaps. For both of those are true. We okay. just kind of have an intermeshed a bit. So, um, yeah, the, the, how I got to meet you was through um, the Animal Flow course. So that's still, that's still something you do, I mean, even though it's COVID virtually. So the Animal Flow Mass Instructor, and you know you're, I think it's the Brickle Heights location, Equinox. Am I right in saying that? Yep. I also worked at the Coral Gables location, which is where I started my career with Equinox. All right. So I got half of it right. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. You got I mean, most of it right. You got I the got... most recent stuff. <laughs> I know you're also from Cali, Colombia. I know that for a fact, right? Nice. Yeah. 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 What an what a interesting tidbit to remember. How do you remember that? So, um, mine i can't remember how it's mr worldwide right here That's yeah he knows everywhere i know everything or <laughs> everyone no i think honestly it was um however i learned it it stuck with me because my uh, my girlfriend is colombian and her mom is from cali also mm. and i went the year of the world cup 2018 so i saw colombia when it was probably at one of the best times to visit you know when everyone's pumped up for the world cup and there it is absolutely buzzing so it was uh that was def and then again it made a connection but yeah. for, for our listeners tell us how you found yourself into the training industry yeah absolutely man so i'll give you the quick version i'm i'm 38 i, I started my fitness journey basically like kind of most people do you know kind of in the weight gym in the weight room i was in the military uh right after high school so that's kind of how I was introduced to the weight room. I played soccer, tennis, and volleyball pretty much my whole life. But then it was really nothing more than just something personal that I did for myself, you know, and also to look sexy and look good and be strong. Uh, after I left my enlistment, I started going to school because that was kind of like my main reason to leave. And I went to Miami Dade and I kept going to the gym. But I'll be honest with you, fellas, you know, to me, the trainer world was such a superficial kind of narcissistic from the outside, my perspective, that I wanted nothing to do with it. You know, I didn't want to be the guy having a million supplements, reading all these magazines. I had a very convoluted kind of view of it. And I, I never really saw it as not even a career or what it's amounted to at this point in my life. But nonetheless, you know, to me, it was valuable to go to the gym and I had my normal results, the three by 12s, get a little cardio in, created my own kind of thing. And while I was in uh, university, I had to, of course, once I finished my AA at Miami-Dade, which is a college, I transferred to the University of Miami. You know, at the University of Miami, it was a big deal for me, you know, uh, coming from a single mother and much more low income to be accepted to such a university was, was a feat on its own for me. And there I was uh, 
you know, blessed not only to have smaller classes, but to meet such inspiring professors that really cared a lot about what they were teaching. And it was not just about the content, but how they did it really resonated with me, specifically a professor of nutrition. His name was Dr. Wes Smith. He's still there at the University of Miami, who sort of inspired me on the subject and to kind of derail where I was going with my career. I was very uh, branding, sports admin, marketing, and even some music industry stuff to really shift into exercise physiology. I switched my degree since then, uh, at that point into exercise physiology and sports administration and really just kind of started seeing a different side of what training meant, you know, seeing the strength and conditioning side of it or seeing how people use it for rehabilitation. And I started seeing a different potential for myself. Um, obviously, as school was wrapping up, I really didn't know where I would end up. I, my biggest hope and achievement was as uh, Angel's Sweaters is their Nike was if I could please just land a job with Nike, you know, yeah, I just wanted an internship. So I was like a madman just trying to apply to that because I only saw it as a lucrative or a fulfilling career if I could just maybe work through the branding side of fitness instead of like the day in day out and some of the facility management stuff just kind of didn't resonate with me. So long story short, you know, I was wrapping up and a buddy of mine worked at Equinox. Uh, he used to work with the heat and now he went off to the Marines, but he told me, Hey, listen, why don't you start over here? I researched Equinox. And again, I saw their branding and marketing side of it and really appreciated that they put a lot of emphasis on education. And I also saw it as a vehicle for me to get some free education and at the same time, get some work experience, you know, maybe I could move into the branding side of Equinox. I wasn't really sure where I would land. Uh, I started with Equinox at Coral Gables there. Uh, now a little bit over 10 years ago. So I, I left at my 10 year mark. I did just about eight or eight and a half years at Coral Gables. And that's when I transferred to Brickell for some pandemic slash kind of cultural stuff that was going on in the moment because I believed in the brand and I just really felt that um, I needed a new opportunity and a new location. Um, obviously, since then, you've seen more or less my career within that interim is where you saw me with Animal Flow. Um, I'll back step a little bit to kind of let you in on where animal flow really was introduced into my life. And it was at Coral Gables as a very junior trainer. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys are uh, Equinox trainers, but a tier one, right? The beginning kind of entry level. And here comes in this kind of six foot Cali looking dude saying he's going to teach us this thing called animal flow. And I was like, all right, cool. That sounds fun. But as most of us, when we see it, we see there's no way I'm going to teach my client that. That's impossible. They're going to complain, their wrists, their knees. But I, I needed something for myself, you know, growing up a lot with hip hop culture and pop and lock in and break dancing. Like I wasn't really finding a way to express myself with movement inside of fitness. It was just pretty sagittal and pretty very strict on the kind of sports specific side of it. So Animal Flow gave me that, just as it gives many people who come to the certification, is a way to kind of express another side of movement that they were looking for. Uh, I fell for it. I, I taught it to my clients. I, I listened to what Mike was putting out and how he had organized these movements into pieces. And I really saw a common sense um, scientific approach to really acquiring these strengths or really finding a different avenue, not only for rehabilitation, but also as it was starting to emerge a little bit more play in movement. Um, after that, I think I was just really blessed with timing and opportunity and just, you know, sometimes the universe gives you a calling. And uh, Mike was only teaching it with another group of only English speaking instructors. So I presented uh, to him the opportunity to spread this program to South America and I could be leading that by teaching it in Spanish and that's probably why you see most of the certifications that I've been doing lately especially virtually have been in Spanish so I'm the South American rep for um, master or for education in that sector it's just that as an internal employee we saw an opportunity for me to teach the program for Equinox employees because I could relate it so much to the way they had learned program design or some of the courses that they were already taking like functional movement systems or strong first and kind of correlate as we did in the certification, I'm sure you remember. So I had a really beautiful and um, 
enlightening opportunity to feel very strong as a Spanish speaking teacher, but also an English speaking teacher. And um, I think that's what uh, Animal Flow provided for me, as well as um, this avenue of movement that really is, is not like anything else I've experienced, not because what I could do with my body, but how it allows me to connect with others, whether it's all of us just working out and coming up with a flow or a client thinking I could never do that. And through the course of six, 12 weeks, through a one-on-one -on -one experience or group experience, being able to put that stuff together and uh, in essence, bring a sense of play into their fitness, right? So that's a, a little bit of the story there. There's obviously some other pieces there, but uh, I wanna turn it over to you guys. If there's anything that sparked your curiosity or that I could expand on, I'd be more than happy. For sure. I think um, that was definitely something I wanted to ask you about was the opportunity you'd have had to teach in South America. It's amazing to hear that you, even through some uncertainty as to the trajectory of your career, as you said, being blessed, some opportunities presenting themselves that you've, it's just maybe from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you, as though you created that role, which is pretty significant. And it's pretty cool. And, um, as being bilingual, having the opportunity to go, is it every country in South America? Is it just the countries that had already had some workshops in? Is it like, did you push more? So yeah, that, that, that happened to specific countries in South America, but we first started by reaching out to other fitness influencers or promoters that we saw maybe were in line with what we were seeing if they had facilities and basically laying it out and the logistics of making it come to life if they wanted or had a need for it. And our first market, of course, was Mexico. That was the closest, which that's more, more Central America. And then we had Chile, Peru, Argentina, which were main markets, which we visited two and three times. But since then, because we've expanded virtually, and this is where COVID sort of switched the role where we kind of knew what we were doing, but had no idea how people will react. And what ended up happening is that the workshops got filled by a variety of people from other countries. So Ecuador, Colombia, Uruguay, Spain started kind of chiming into these workshops because they could log in from wherever they were. And that sometimes presented a easier situation for them than having to drive and stop their life to go all the way out in town because most of these people, like they live like in the outskirts, they don't live in the cities where we would be doing this. And the commutes are anywhere from two to four to a full day to try to get to some of these workshops uh, in person. So I think virtual really was huge for them. And I think that they see because virtual is so, uh, so easy for them, they could now solicit and teach to other people in their regions. You know, I mean, think about the entire country of Argentina and they're all reaching out to their specific regions to now teach them animal flow, right? So that was a lot of business for them in that capacity where in their countries, they're more locked down than even we are. They can't go out in the street, they can't meet, so they're struggling. And I think this op opportunity was, yes, useful for me and awesome that I could keep working and doing what I'm doing, but I think people see it as a business opportunity, right? I can learn this stuff that I can mm. teach piece by all piece. Over. Where it, Right. There, there's, an, there's an end choreography or an end goal towards each specific session. And then as a group, there's also like, as we've learned from like, what's the session of a, what's the goal of a micro session, right? Or micro cycle versus like a macro. So a client, a group class, they see that with animal flow. If we were here uh, actually doing the flow, y'all would know that at the end of this hour, we're going to put together some sort of flow. Whether you do it perfect or not, something's going to happen at the end of this. And that's what we're working towards today. And then let's say six weeks from now, you guys are like, dude, we've been working on that flow. I remember when I first did it, I felt like I could never do that. And in six short weeks, I not, I've only had given you that um, kind of live experience of like, I can't and I can. So that perception shift or paradigm shift, but you've also worked out in that process. And I think a lot of our Spanish speakers and English speakers are seeing that opportunity with animal flow. And I could tell you from personal experience, because I am currently offering it in person here in Miami, and I'm getting more requests to do it online than people showing up to that class. Wow. So much more people are like, show me online, show me online. And then I'm in person ready to do it, which what we think people want more of, and they're not showing up. 
Wow. You have a pretty, now, you have a not pretty, not to say that there could, sorry, go on, go on, sorry. No, 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 no. I was just going to say that you, not to take anything away from, yes, we can promote the class more. Yes. It just started a month ago in person. This stuff takes time. But if I were to launch right now on Instagram, Hey, I'm going live in a week from now. And I'm going to teach you a $5 a class, $10 a class. I'm not selling it would sell out, but for sure I'd get five or six people. I feel confident of that. Mm. And I'm not even able to get those numbers with as much promotion as they're doing with their marketing team at own movement, where I work out of the facility and as I'm doing for the last month, which is pretty interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that, um, so all three of us are based in New York city and something, at least I sometimes forget is the, unless you're in New York city in terms of commuting and getting to the gym, as you mentioned, at least in South America, if you said some of these workshops are two to four hours or a day away. And yeah, I know I take it for granted sometimes in New York city when you can jump on the subway, jump on a trip, whatever it is. And you'd be there within 10, 20 minutes. Whereas if you're, if you're like you're saying, like my, my knowledge of Miami and Florida isn't that great. Angel has a better idea. But if, if <laughs> you're seeing the, you know, the walks just at 2 PM, but commitments mean that you, you know, if you have kids to look after because they're homeschooling or mm-hmm. now the opportunity that you don't have to leave the apartment, you know, and you have a pretty sick space. I always see you on that green lawn. Is that like in your building or something? You got it. You got it. You know, I've, oh, wow. I've really it, it, guys like I know in New York, how it is. I've taught there. My brother's there. I grew up in long Island. Like it's hustle grind. If mm. that space was available in New York, you'd have six <laughs> trainers out there filming. And I'd look down there and I'm like, I'm just in disbelief. You know, everybody's dying to get into Brickle or get into some other scene or some mural. And there's these very small common spaces that some people are using it, but I see such great potential there that sometimes I'm even hesitant when I'm videoing, like, am I doing something wrong? Why isn't everybody doing this right now? And it's a nice open space. It's turf. It's quiet. There's a good breeze. And I really hope to put off more content there because it, it, it is the next step, or as I believe what the hybrid is going to be for going forward in the fitness industry or how we deliver fitness. We really are going to have to become familiar with this space and see the benefit of it. I have clients that see me in person and they see me virtually. It's become almost unexcusable for some of my clients to follow a program or if we want to reframe that verbiage and say it, they have every opportunity to be successful because I can see them virtually. And now they've already put their foot in the water and they feel comfortable with it. Like that wasn't that bad. Matter of fact, that session kind of felt kind of awesome. I had a client sign up at a gym at a hotel that he was set up the camera. You know, he's not this kind of embarrassed kind of dude. We had a fantastic TRX session. And I know we want to rah, rah, the one-on-one in person rather, but virtual isn't that bad. It strains us to have to verbally be better communicators and have to do more preparation. So those people who are used to prepping are like, what's the big deal guys. And those of us who are very used to like, I'm good at thinking on the spot. I can think quick. I can adapt reactive. It's really shaken us because online crutches us that way where we could manually get in there and say, no, no, just put your shoulder here. Now you have to really think of the words and the tools you're going to need with a limited space to make that happen. But when you do, I think as a inner, you grow so much and in person you're like incredible. Like it's just, it's risen me, I think to another level of understanding my client and the stuff that I'm seeing one-on-one, which is, where I'm seeing the bulk of my success with, with train space and this company I've just uh, created a few months ago, to be honest with you, fellas. That's awesome. I, um, Angel, you want to jump in? Yeah, I just want to jump in really quickly because um, something that you said really resonated with me uh, when you were speaking about training virtually and how the success of virtual training really comes in your verbiage and your word usage. Um, I think that as, a, as trainers, typically if we had, Uh, a map of things that we would do. I think the first thing we would do is teach our client, you know, how to move their body in free space. So what is scapular retraction? What is protraction? What is external rotation at the shoulder? These terms that we sometimes glaze over when somebody's right in front of you and depending on their personality, they might be less patient and just like ready to go and they don't want to 
focus on like how to move their wrist. They're being moving their wrist for <laughs> God knows how, their their whole life, but they don't really yeah, care yeah. about flexion or extension, right? Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. But but this is really uh, for me at least. I've been really working on using that verbiage and using that language in order to teach the movements first. Uh, let them know what verbiage I'm going to use in order for them to understand this is what I mean by scapular retraction. This is what I mean by protraction. Uh, And that helps them know what to do as well as they get a better feel of the movement pattern itself. Um, Because we all know somebody who's done rows and they're just like their arms burn out, but they don't feel anything in their back or something like that. Right. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that, Angel. It sounds to me like you're saying you're, you're, you're really setting up like certainty, which I think it, like you were saying, it challenges us trainers to face the dirty, dark demons that weave inside being so insecure where we could just put a box or put a yoga block or say, let me just fix you. Now it's saying, how are you going to communicate that? You don't have all the tools. And those of us who've already been doing that or that maybe found a little bit of, um, I don't want to say passion, but, uh, drive from learning how to be that way from other coaches that we've seen just be magnificent cures to really come up with cues or research that so that we can be better prepared for those sessions. And uh, again, that comes to one-on-one, but also in group sessions when you're doing them via Zoom, you know, you have to say things that relate to a big group. So you have to think, is this going to connect to everybody here? Only people who play sports, right? But it's been, it's been interesting. At, at times, I have a hard time not confessing that this was a good thing, right? Mm. I have a hard time not admitting that I'm doing better. I've grown. And maybe it's because of the struggles I've already had in my life that have forced me to see that a struggle is really a blessing about to bloom or flower, Or maybe it's just because I've just been such an adaptive person that I've been able to put those skills to play. Like, okay, what's the next thing? But also said, all right, you're going to really have to be better about how you communicate, which clients you take on and work with. And to the clients that continue to work with me, they also had to put effort, set up the mat six to eight feet away, set up your TRX. Like they had to do that. And I think in them having to do that, they also um, grew in a different way. And and those people don't see the pandemic the way the majority of people do. They see it as, okay, this was different. This is an opportunity, Uh, but but they're doing better. They're doing better. A hundred percent. I don't want to move movement and career wise movement and professionally is what I mean. Like all together. Right. 100%. And I think that the readiness, uh, I I was guilty of setting things up for my clients uh, before the session or during the session, right? They didn't have to touch anything that wasn't six feet away from them. So I would go, I knew where the mats were, I would roll out the mat, you know, now it's, they need to buy a mat if they don't have it, they need to know which way is the right way to set it up, how much space they have, where they need to set up the camera. Uh, And I think that it is working to your point. In, in regards to fitness and in regards to um, exercise, consistency, things of that sort, it has been almost a blessing in disguise. It's an opportunity. I think every challenge is an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I also see it with some of my clients with making them more autonomous when it comes to just getting their own thing. Sometimes I think when, whenever I start with a new client, I like to tell them, well, I'm going to teach you how to do certain things so that I won't be having to hold your hand the whole time because you're going to go yeah. to a different gym with, with people that, you know, aren't from this location and you're going to have to go find the bumpers. You have to go find the barbell. You have to find your own space and be confident to, you know, do it. Um, and it's great, especially to looking at them, how it is that they move too. you know, watching them go get their weights. You could definitely even check how it is that they're, 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 uh, if they've had a limp, like, is it still there or is, is their hip going one way? Are they, are they hunching forward a lot? Um, and I think it's, it's a big positive in that respect. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if you guys agree, I, or and I'm sure you have probably seen also some of the highlights of how well you worked with that client or that group one-on-one prior to COVID. Because then when you see how well they do virtually, you're like, damn, I, we were teaching that right. That person was yeah. really paying attention 
And I've had an experience where, you know, when we stir first got off, I stayed with Equinox and we were doing everything through a lift. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. And sometimes virtually you can't really get clarity on if they're doing it properly. Like you go, I think, I mean, if I could see that side view and, and it gives you that insecurity. So you have to almost let go of an aspect of control where you're like, we got to do the reps. Mm. Time is the time, you know? jumping jacks for 30 seconds i don't know if they're landing properly on their knee and ankle they might hurt their fascia the next day because they're not used to bouncing that way so there was a certain amount of risk that we had to kind of let go and trust that our clients are going to make better decisions in a one-on-one -on -one session or in a group and then seeing them and this is the experience i'm talking about then seeing them one-on-one -on -one after three or four months of doing this virtual stuff and actually seeing how much better they're moving or how well they were executing on their own was has also been really, really fulfilling and rewarding to know that just sticking to the process, trusting to, you know, these programming rules that we've learned or these kinesiology exercise science parameters that we've all been conditioned to pay attention to, you know, bilateral before unilateral. Am I doing this dynamically before I'm doing it statically? Do they understand, like you were saying, Angel, has really shown us what we've also been doing really well and what they've been doing really well. So um, I've, um, I've had good things to say about what's going on the pandemic. Um, uh, there's other aspects of it at, at a personal level where the pandemic has affected me, but um, it's tough to see. It's tough to see where this didn't help us as a society, uh, as an industry, and then personally. Yeah, it's the, uh, I, no, sorry, I Jack, go ahead. no, go on. I was just going to piggyback off that as well, where it's very, it's very unfortunate and as stressful as this whole thing is, I draw, um, um, similarities in your, in your comments about there's definitely been some positives that came out of this. That's what I was going to say where, where you said if it was personally, professionally, there were, and then, and then touching on or the, the society. Yeah. Right. And, and I think there, um, you know, I, it, and I know virtual training isn't for everyone and it's not condemning anyone who doesn't believe in it, but the client, as you said as well, the clients that have carried on training have said, all right, I'm not letting a pandemic stop me from getting to my goals. I'm not allowing a pandemic or the six, six feet apart, stopping me from still communicating trainers, still getting to where I should be getting to and working on my weaknesses. And that's why I think those people who get it and know that this shouldn't be a hiccup that really stops you. If there's a will, there's a way. And it's just, it's, it's uh, really refreshing to hear that there's been the same success stories of you, but uh, yeah. There was gonna. There's also another point where sometimes if a session, it's, a virtual, it, se I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I think it's lagging a little bit. But uh, I would. Yeah, just you. <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're good. It just it just cut off a little bit. You're good. You're good. <laughs> All right. Cool. I'll try to keep it quick. Uh, so what I was gonna say is, uh, it gives us an opportunity as coaches if we have a poor session virtually to wonder why that happened, right? What, where was the fallout? Was it the lag, right? Was it the te uh, technical issues? Um, was it the positioning of my camera? Was it the microphone? Was it the audio? What happened during that session? And then you can work from there to build off of that to create a better session and overall better experience for the client. Uh, I did want to change gears a little bit towards um, like you being an instructor and how you've been able to pivot to virtual. Um, so as an instructor, how have you been able to meet the demands of coaches during the pandemic in regards to them getting certifications, continuing education, things like that? Uh, I know that your uh, animal flow instructor is strong first. Are you an instructor in that as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, how have so, you- um, yeah, I well. work, so, I'm not really sure why it gets a little confusing and, and only for clarity's sake. So I work with the company Animal Flow. I'm one of their contracted employees. So I'm one of their teachers for the program that Mike Fitch created. With Strong First, I, I'm just like anyone else that got certified. I am a coach. I'm just a Strong First level one, level two coach and Strong First body weight. Hopefully lifting will come around soon too because I'm excited to do that. 
Uh, and as far as promoting those certifications, it really has come down to having a strong team with Animal Flow, where our director, Shannon, Karen, and some of our other help behind the scenes have helped not only promote it, but keep it in people's view, like what we're doing and that it's still here and we're still staying alive and still providing the service even while things were going on, right? So I always kind of compare it to the person selling like bags of chip at the corner. Like even if it's raining, I'm there selling the bags of chips, right? So it's, it, I think it's that kind of reliability where people maybe didn't know what to do or what they could do. And we were still providing something, whether it was in the animal flow certified instructors page, giving homeworks and people, keeping people interactive or people hosting classes for free or talking about it or sharing it to let people know, hey, we're still here. By that time, when we offered our first Animal Flow certification live, whether it was me or one of the other instructors, people, people and by people, I mean specifically fitness professionals, were kind of hungry to get more of that information. So I think that and combined with how we take in the payment was very useful. We allow half payment now, half payment a week before the class. They're very good about staying in communication and giving information about what, what is to be expected of them, how the camera and everything should be set up and what's going to be going on during that day. You know, we send all of the manuals, et cetera. So I think it does come down to some part luck, which, you know, obviously luck is created, but a lot of it, just this commitment to saying, we love this thing. We're going to continue to do this thing. However, people want to consume it and then offer it later. And we had a little bit of those efforts come back to us and be able to still stay alive in this pandemic, teaching certifications in English and in Spanish and also globally where we have people teaching it in India, in Japan, and also in uh, Germany. And they have been staggered. So we do have some instructors who haven't gotten any work and haven't had an opportunity to teach, particularly some of our actually US instructors. Um, again, I just feel very grateful that because I speak Spanish, because I was thinking of this opportunity now, it's now landed me to be in a position where I can do what I feel is my true purpose, which is how can I help this industry become better than it was when I came in it. And I think we all know what I mean when I'm talking about that. It's how are our consumers educated and what are they consuming? And then either thinking we're the same thing or trying to replace us for it because of a very, very clever marketing or very um, uh, psychologically skewing advertising. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And that seems like an awesome And approach. I think that's what you guys are doing. I hope. I that's think that's what you guys are doing. I think that's what you guys are doing. You're trying to put people who um, either believe the same things that you believe or have similar experience in the forefront and have them be heard. And I, I do want to say thank you guys because I, I do appreciate an opportunity to, to speak a little bit on the subject. So let me know uh, where we go from there and we'll continue. No, 100%. <laughs> I think that it's, it's great to get advice and get some feedback from people who are in the field and have been doing the groundwork because I've taken my fair share of virtual um, certification classes and I've always mm -hmm. wondered sometimes, you know, how do they stay afloat? How do you pivot? Um, what, what do you do in terms of payment? Like how do you manage those payment mm -hmm. methods when it comes to, when it comes down to that? Uh, but you guys have done a great job at uh, allowing feedback, getting feedback from your um, clients, as well as uh, managing expectations and setting the groundwork beforehand. Hey, listen, this is what we're going to do. This is the game plan. This is what we'll need from you, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the next question that I have for you is how have you managed your time between instructing and uh, mm -hmm. teaching your clients one-on-one, -on -one, uh, whether in person or virtual uh, and all the other stuff. How do you manage all of that? And where do you find your balance and your own workouts in your own life? Uh, so uh, first, I, I want to finish the tail end of what we were speaking about, which was, you know, that's how Animal Flow has been pivoting or managing. I, I know that you may or may not be aware that I started Train Space in June 19th of 2020, which was in the middle of this. So my pivot was more so where could I see income for my kids, of course, and for my life where I'm at. 
and still create something that I feel like I can stand for, right? Because I needed to shift and see where the opportunities were. So creating train space and learning all of those things, not only from how Animal Flow and that company has been doing it, it's been just an enormous amount of research and reading and trial and error for the payment acceptance or if it's with clients, okay, how can I set them up to be more successful within the situation while still making myself available to the animal flow community and creating my own group things. So to now leading to what you're asking with time management, you know, time management to me has been an ever ongoing battle. You know, I'm, I'm going to be the first to confess it here. It is not easy for me. It is challenging. It is an ever growing process. I would hate for anyone to go forward the way that I go forward sometimes carrying guilt and shame because you struggle with that. So if there's anything that people take back from this podcast is if you struggle with time management, don't layer shame or guilt on top of that. All of us are struggling with a little bit of that in some capacity, push forward, push onward, see that you were five minutes behind on something and push to the next thing. You continue to tailor it, continue to see what things that I prepped before that made that successful and knowing that sometimes it's not going to be that way. Some people are immaculate with their time management and we see that because they're always on time, but don't be confused or swayed that other aspects of their life are, are hit or miss. Maybe how your time management is hit or miss, but they have other parts of their life that are hit or miss. So don't beat yourself down with that. I have a hard time with it. I'm working on it. It's an ongoing struggle, but I know the value. I see where it can give me more uh, fruits or make me more frugal because of the organization and tranquility that it will bring or has brought my life when I have sacrificed saying no to something else, whether it be an extra 30 minutes working out or that really good conversation I'm having with my client. I don't want to break it up. And seeing that being on time, I gave more to others. I'm not like that all the time, but I know it's there. So if anyone takes anything from my personal experience, different from animal flow is don't beat yourself up for the time management. It is worth the squeeze with that one but it's, we're all working on it somehow. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing changing of the puzzle. At the moment, I try to wake up somewhere around 7, 8 a.m., do a little bit of morning admin, have a sit-down breakfast with my girlfriend because I also want to practice what I preach and it's taking some time. While she starts answering emails, I start looking at what's going on with my clients that I'm coaching online, which it's not too many right now, so it doesn't take too much of my time. And then I go out to head to see clients. I see somewhere around two, three, sometimes four a day. And then when I come home, I either look at what social media stuff I could double dip and maybe get a workout and then talk tidbits about it during my stories and then see which one of those are valuable or where people are really trending to come see me and what they really want me for. So start exploiting more of that when it comes to training space. I want to give people what they want. I don't want to be the center of attention. I'm looking harder and harder for ways to take me out of the spotlight and help direct a squad like what it seems you fellows are doing, which I I, um, commend you for. And what an awesome pairing that you guys can find each other to work together towards something, which is what I would like. The same thing with train space, right? Where can we find a space for the people who are the outliers, who feel like maybe they're not doing it right and what stuff I am putting out whether it's educational resources, strategies with one-on-one clients, or taking on small groups of trainers and taking them through a six to 12 week experience where they're not only learning themselves, but learning how to become better coaches, right? But all this stuff is a process. You know, I'm under a year of opening my LLC. And and one of the things I keep reminding myself is to be patient because I want so much as I think a lot of us do because Social media is telling us, look at this person. Look, they caught up. Where are they at? Where are you going? Where are you going? And it, it's tough, guys. It's, I know. I know. Sometimes I got to turn it off and not consume because I'm like, man, I'm feeling like a bag of shit right now. <laughs> yep. You know? You got but so many I Instagram just, trainers now. You can't keep up. I know. It's, it's very crazy. challenging. And you, you, when, when you look at the ones that really fill you, they tell you, stop looking, guys. Yeah. Stop looking. 
And I hope that people see mine and they get a different feeling that they don't feel, man, I'm left behind. Instead, they could feel like, okay, I'm good. And if that means, cause I'm not at my handstand yet, or because I can't press a 44 kilo and that makes them feel like, okay, I'm good. I'm okay with that. Because I, I, I love that feeling of, man, if it wasn't for me seeing you do this, I wouldn't have risen to that. And that's what I want training space to be about. A place where we create space for each other, for the things we wanted that are out of our life and to live this human experience. Because what are we really here for, right? Are we here to make money and be busy and look busy and look important? Or are we here to consume our environment, our people, grow bonds, have friendships, something like this, have good conversations? That's what I want to be more of a part of. And uh, again, thank you guys for letting me talk a little bit about that stuff been inside yeah. brewing <laughs> <laughs> um i have i have a question uh in regards sure. to i think the, the programming side of animal flow of strength work how what what do you think from your experience is what makes animal flow so appealing to a lot of people and what what is it that you think it, it they want to get out of it does that make sense well, i hope i, I yeah. you know it, it, if i if i'm hearing you what you're asking is why do you think people gravitate to animal flow um, about that experience, whether it's the programming or whatnot, is that correct? Yeah. So it, there's two answers to that because obviously there's two people who consume the product. There's general pop. Actually there's tends to be like three pe types of people, which it's general pop. People who don't know what it is. It looks like yoga, whatever, whatever. I want to try this new thing. Then there's people who are very big fitness enthusiasts who might not be fitness pros, but they're like all about it. They want the next thing, which we call our animal flow specialists. If they come to the certification, that's why we call it animal flow workshop and not certification is because we want to leave it open for people who might not have a cert in PT of uh, uh, personal training is what I mean by that. And then lastly, it's to fitness professionals, right? They really obviously like it because it's a certification CEUs, and also I'm gonna learn this cool thing that people are doing, it's trending, or, hey, I wanna do that, that's for me, which is kind of the main response when I go to the certification and I ask trainers, why are you here, what do you like? It's, this is for me, this looks really cool. If it can help clients, awesome, but like, let me figure this out. So those are all the reasons that I think people come. I think the reasons people stay is because it has a very thorough way of physically teaching people how to go through their a um, cognitive process of learning, associative, and then that autonomous phase, right? Where it's each phase, but just like we would see it in any exercise, right? So I'll use the push-up for an example. If you have a client, they come in, they don't know it, there's an entry point for that, for that position. There's also stuff you do before, isn't there? Protraction, retraction, as Angel mentioned, wrist mobilizations, hey, you're gonna be on your hands, core activation, Whatever we feel, mindset, breathing, understanding, whatever that client needs. Animal flow does the same thing. Activations, body awareness, set your shoulder blades, et cetera. And then we take it a step level, step, and we say, okay, well, now I want you to move a couple of steps, whether that be taking one of our positions into locomotion, which is one of our six components, or in a push-up saying, let me see how that feels and give me some now scap push-ups. See how it feels without the arms, right? Same thing here. And then as the program evolves or a session that you're directing just to the animal flow as in the push-up, eventually you have that person doing some version of the push-up, which they in that moment in that session are prepared to do. The quote unquote flow of their body in a push-up. Because I think we can all agree guys that a push-up is a orchestra of things going on at the same time that we could easily also say is fluid. If the person is focused, lasered in, and thinking about all the components, correct? Yeah. Well, animal flow does the same thing when you do a flow. Nobody does the flow super duper perfect with every moon super executed, but they get a taste of it, just like in the push-up. I got a taste of it. It's not perfect, but they're getting a taste of it. And same thing with the flow. They get a taste of it. So if you are seeing me in a one-on-one -on -one session and you're like, I'm here with one-on-one, -on -one, Whatever we do, Freddie, teach me a flow. Teach me something. I can't say that a flow is equivalent to 315 on the bench. It's not. 
right? 315 on the bench for a flow would be equivalent to me asking you to do three minutes of it with hold and excellent execution. That would be the 315 <laughs> equivalent because that would hurt you the same way. Three yeah, minutes of just flowing, that's too much. We all know that unless they're prepared over time, tissue, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But they can do a flow. You could use the bar. Same thing with animal flow. So I think if I take it back to why people stay, is that unconsciously they start noticing that. And unconsciously, I mean mainly our uh, fitness enthusiasts or people who are consuming the product just for their own liking. The fitness pros, the really smart, that really take my um, preaching to heart, which is take a look at the details, start figuring that out as well. And they start seeing how they can break it up and still deliver their message to their session whether it's using pieces of the animal flow program in one-on-one -on -one or in group settings. Some people decide to take it all animal flow where they say, Hey, we're going to learn a flow that I created. Now it's personal because that instructor or trainer, Angel, David, or Jax, you created your flow. That's yours. Animal flow didn't give you that animal flow gave you the pieces. You put it together. Now you're sharing that with your client. The client sees that they got more because it was a flow than a pushup, which we would both argue, hey, the push-up is just as valuable, and I would agree with you. But the flow makes it, again, what people like. I want to feel like I did something cool. I want to feel like there was an end-of-the-session package. What was the conclusion of that story that you gave me at the end of the session? And I think that that's what Animal Flow provides. It provides that. In group fitness, that's what we do. We teach you pieces. We go through mobilizations. We go through activations. We do a little sweat, but at the end of it, I teach you a flow. If I was doing one-on-one -on -one and you said, Freddie, that's what I hired you for, we would slowly be piecing together over whatever amount of time you wanted to work with me, a flow. Just as if you were to have hired me for a handstand or a 315 bench. Eventually we would get to that two minute flow or three minute flow, one minute flow, wherever we are. So. I hope that answers the question. I think that's the reason why people stay. There's other tech stuff why people stay. We're now offering the app on demand. So anyone can log in and just look at a class, do a workout, do an advanced move. So if you're an instructor or not, and you're like, I just want to go for it, you could use that app, which has become a resource. We've also noticed that that doesn't take away from the certifications or people who teach it one-on-one -on -one because there's been some, some studies. I don't know if they saw, but they did a study on if people prefer a Zoom class, like if I was teaching you guys right now, or like a very high-end, various kind of the Equinox or Peloton. Oh, yeah. And although they're big sellers, there's a sense of connection when the person is there that they will sacrifice the lack of quality of the video, so how our video yep. is now, because they get to see me. And I'm like, oh no, don't do that, move here. Versus if this was like super high def, I was in the sickest background, sickest clothes, just like various, because it's dope. It is dope. But after a while, it gets kind of mundane. Versus if you're always meeting with me, people prefer that. It right? makes it personable. It makes it personable. You're all hold, hold accountable. 100%. Yeah. I think you I personally, 100% agree. I would rather have a Zoom than a Varys type situation any day. Right. But it sells because we all want to feel like we're buying something top notch and top quality. So when I buy various, I feel like I'm buying the latest Nikes. When I buy Zoom, I feel like I'm buying a pair of Feiyus, which us who like to move know the Feiyus are a better like buy, Feiyus. right? Feiyus are cool. Yeah, they're a better buy. <laughs> they've they've become move, a lot uh, they've become more mainstream. I've seen a lot of ads, yeah, like really top-notch yeah. ads on them online now. Yeah, yeah, which is why I use that reference because we all know now if you put on a pair of Feiyus, I feel nice in a flow. You try to put on a pair of Nikes, all of a sudden, I feel like my mobility dropped. I feel clunky. And yeah, that's Jacques. kind of one of the main things get I tell you to take your shoes off. <laughs> yeah, get them Feyus, get some uh, Vivo Barefoots, Vibram Five Fingers if you want, which it's a much better use for the type of shoe than running. The Vibram Five Fingers, I, I use them all the time. I use them more as like a, a therapy, so to speak, once a week, putting them on, make sure my toes can also move inside of it. Because even though I'm doing flow, my own pinky is going to try to stay closer as I'm moving around. And in the Vibrams, they're forced to see every movement with toes separated. So without going into a tangent, that's kind of what I see. Feyus are Zoom. 
where it might not seem like they're fancy, but at the end of the day, you know, you got that, uh, what's the saying? You got that hundred dollar shoes with the 10 cent squat. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You get that kind of experience <laughs> while Various Various is giving you that. Peloton is giving you that. You got everything you want. You got the best colors, the sexiest girls, the sexiest guys. But again, that's a hundred dollar product that's selling for 15, 20 bucks. People think they're killing it, that they've hacked the fitness industry. And again, for anyone listening out there that's still hustling it one-on-one -on -one in group, it's not going to end for us. There's still the personable People are going to need to connect with others more than ever as this virtual starts coming to light. Just as when automobiles became a thing, you could still want to ride that horse, but eventually you're going to have to buy yourself a Ford. And mm -hmm. that's going to be the same thing when it comes to virtual. I know people are fighting it, but eventually at least some of your sessions are going to be virtual. Some of your work, maybe a recovery session, maybe something is going to be virtual. And there's a hell of a lot of growth to, to doing that transfer. Just like learning anything new. It's tough at the beginning. But um, I think we're all better for it. And I hope people see that. Um, I have one thing that's been nagging me for the week that yes, I wanted sir. to ask you when, when I realized that we were having you were going to be on. Since you are Strong First certified as well, Animal Flow certified, what do you think about I've seen these flows with kettlebells. Right. You know, like I've yeah. seen them, you know, I've seen people use a, I mean, not light bell. I, mean, I don't, I don't yeah. think I've seen anybody do with a 32 or anything like that, but, you know, doing these flows that with the kettlebell look like they could be potentially risky. Yeah. And, you know, some of them I, I see with their shoulders internally rotated and they're doing all these things. And it's like, yeah. all right, you have a couple of thousand views and likes, but like it doesn't, it really probably won't be as beneficial in the long run. Yeah. What yeah. do you think about those? Well, do you find a benefit in that or do you think it's just for show? Well, my opinion is both of those answers are true. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on why and where, why, where we should stand with it. Because I feel what you feel. I feel mm -hmm. the same thing. Look at the shoulder position. What's up with that? They're rushing it. And as I've learned from really going into the corrective aspect and performance, it's, it's the same thing with anything else. You know, why do we want to put save on the software when it's not really there yet, which is adding weight? And with animal flow, we talk about that, which is we don't want to add weight to an animal flow pattern because we want the focus to be intrinsic. The 30 second or probably shorter than that pitch of animal flow is animal flow is simply a body weighted program to help people reconnect with their bodies using the floor. So to help people reconnect with their bodies. So if I have an external thing out, my focus becomes that external thing, which is, I think, what you might be saying, hey, you know, you're not paying attention to your form, right? Yeah. However, I stand on another side of loaded movement training and fascial training, which I really love, and I just happen to select a different modality to train that. I don't prefer – kettlebells are my strength and conditioning masters. I bow to them. They are where I go to become resilient to get my butt kicked and to keep it straightforward. There are some three dimensional movements, which I love, but again, they're very useful in the corrective side of it. The windmill, the push press, the, um, yeah, the windmill, push press, double jerk, a lot of that for power stuff, right? Mm -hmm. However, where people might start moving in different patterns with a kettlebell, I take it to the Viper. I go to the Viper to load my tissue, to change and do these kind of um, more outside, multiple plane, ex, you know, outside of the realm of what we would see. So my opinion about them is that we have people who teach good flows with kettlebells and we still have people who want to teach them but might not quite be there. I personally wouldn't recommend it for new clients, but I wouldn't recommend doing a Viper flow with a new client either. Yeah. I think Viper provides a little bit safer because it's rubber. So the person can drop it or they can hit themselves with it and it's a little safer and I prefer it, but I don't think there's anything the new wrong ones hurt with too. learn. You feel like they hurt? <laughs> the new Vipers too. I mean, at least the, uh, like the edge of the tubes look like plastic. What are you doing? They're but, they're, huh? but they're a little firmer. You know? they're, yeah. They're, 
they're a little firmer. I still have the old one and the old one really feels like really heavy kind of glue where you're like, Ugh, yeah, while yeah. these solid ones are easier to control. I can't mm -hmm. wait to get one of those. But yeah, man, I mean, you also have to look at the other side of it. There's a lot of people and this is what I think you all are doing and what I want to do, which is we want to make room for people to understand what they're watching. And if when somebody's seeing a very cool marketing flow video, there is a step-by-step -step process to get there. Just like if you see a very cool animal flow, you're not just going to do it the first day. You have to start with basics. And I think trainers are starving for attention because we know it translates to dollars and followers. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're just trying to go with what they think is best. So I think if what we're seeing is in honor of trying to better yourself, it's fine. We just need to bring clarity to the people who consume that product. Does that make sense? So if I see someone who's not in the fitness industry who I know doing a flow, I might hit them up privately and say, hey, do you, do you mind if I give you some advice on that? If it's a trainer, I'm probably gonna understand they're just trying to do their grind. Like they think this will sell, that's their strength. And then over time, which I have seen, some trainers really improve their flow. their kettlebell flow practice and they're doing really good with it. And if they have a proper way of teaching it, which we all know, then go for it. When we see that poor pretty shitty, in my opinion, based on uh, anatomy, position, glute recruitment. So I didn't go hate. I created one for myself. And mm -hmm. then I made a really cool video and I put some music because I saw something. So I said, here's something that I feel could be done better. I'm just going to do it. And if some other trainer sees me and says, that guy's got it wrong, I hope he does it better. And I hope he gives more instruction yeah. and cues again. Because if I see it, I'll be like, damn, I could have done that better if I take my ego out of it. And that's what I mm -hmm. hope that the most of us that are coming out that are becoming more mindful and more aware of our own self need to self please can guide and elevate the industry for that. Because like I said, when I started with you guys today, what I saw when I was, I'm 38 now, when I was 18 and 20 was a lot of self feeding trainers you know, sex, 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 shirts off, big booties. We still see a little bit of that, that really kind of shat almost even on bodybuilding, which if you know bodybuilding and you know sculpting, you know those guys take it serious and there's a lot more science and stuff going on with them that deserves some credit. But some people have taken that and turned it into a marketing branding monster. And I think that it's up mm -hmm. to us to start turning that curve and now more than ever, do we have that opportunity? Because I know that I'm a dime a dozen. I know tons of people that want to do what I want to do. I know a lot of people believe what I want to believe. And that's good news. That's awesome. Because hopefully consumers will start seeing that and we'll be able to put out better products, charge what we deserve for the effort and autonomy that we're putting in, not only into these clients and group fitness, but to the world, guys. Because I believe that when people transform their lives, it vibrates out and everybody does. And I wanna plug in a book called The New Earth by Elkhart Tolle, who talks about the great flowering, just like when the first flower bloomed. And I think that that's where we're headed if we all start becoming a little bit more aware of where we are and when our ego is speaking or when someone else's ego is speaking to us and remove What's that. What's the name of the book again? It's called New Earth, New Earth okay. by, by Elicart Toll. And it's, it's just a, a book to read and think. You don't have to mm -hmm. get through it fast. There's parts of it and that we could digest. And I, I think if more of us just consider that point of view, because it's non-denominational or saying, you know, Buddhist or anything like that, uh, we could start seeing the world the way that most of us right now on this call are, which is COVID was rough and I got really fucking uncomfortable. But now I'm here coming out.
the other end and why the fuck do I feel so strong right now? And that's a good thing. Yeah. Our first episode, I was coughing up a lung. And look at me now. <laughs> look at you, chilling. <laughs> but David's going to mention chillin', that the chillin', day no. before he did 500 swings and maybe that part played a role. Hey. And I'm still convinced that the 500 swings gave me COVID. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> Thank uh, you. That was, that, was, I, I, that was a good way to put it when, when it comes to, I think, people posting videos and, you know, other people posting reaction videos or videos in response to. That's a great yeah. way to do it rather than, rather than yeah. you know, just looking at it, feeling bad and not doing anything yeah. about it. Cool. Thank it's, you. It's also... And if you see some kettlebell flow that's sick, pump it. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with that? If I see a kettlebell flow that's sick, I'll be like, yo, this guy's killing it. If I see a viper, that's uh, someone doing animal flow, it's like, it, we fight it. Guys, I feel it too. Like, oh, should I? Like, I don't want this to take from me and, and I'm really trying to do my business. And But fight that desire to throw a little bit of shade and say, this person's doing it right. I'm going to throw it out there because what's my real purpose? Am I trying to elevate or am I trying to make this about me? Yeah, Go ahead, that, uh, Jack, I cut you off. No, it's okay. I was just going to chip in pretty much what you were saying where um, that becomes infectious, where we feed off each other. And if we say, you know, this is actually, you've, this is, this looks sick. This is a good job. And I think it's, um, at least I ha- I've seen in my circle in the past where there have been some people that their focus of content has been, don't do this or don't be this guy and do it like this. You must do it like this. And sometimes if we have a better, if we have a different mindset, more of the, Hey, um, like you're doing a good job. And, and as you said, when you break down animal flow, or when you break down the, the push up or the bench press, everyone starts somewhere. Everyone starts a little somewhere a little different. And you never know where that person is on their journey and just re- like respect that. And, and also, um, at least in all of us being trainers in the gym setting, when it comes to January, we think, oh, fucking hell, here we go again. Here come all those New Year's resolutioners. And something that a trainer spoke to me years ago said, hey, well, I know, like, you know this comes around every year, but at least this person or at least these people are making the more conscious effort to try and change habits and patterns and without going into the detail of however long lived that is just just uh, like not necessarily promote it but just be conscious that these people are trying to make a change and as opposed to knocking them down be encouraging about it and it's the same thing where you mentioned with a post when you see someone doing something um it, it there's too much negative energy and too many negative things going on in the world in general and especially this last year and covid has been so difficult the last thing we need is spreading more negative influences or comments the more positive ones you can you can generate and feed off i completely agree and without taking too much more of your time because you want to respect the fact that you probably have a busy day but the other thing i will say and for our followers who might not be following you yet and should follow you something i've always found with your work on your instagram is you're very original with what you post and it's always very clear as to you mentioned a work in progress right whether it's a handstand movement i know i think based on the time i followed you it should literally be my name, the work in progress, because I just have this fascination with this struggle. I feel like I'm like borderline masochistic when I'm like, dude, because it's just life comes at you, man. And I mean, this could be for another time. We could talk about something else when it comes yeah. to the external effect. I don't know if you guys know, I'm a father of twins and they're currently uh, located in Seattle. So I've spent a year without my kids and it's been pretty pretty detrimental so when i tell you that i've been uncomfortable i've been uncomfortable you know things have been tough i've worried about child support payments or more or rent here or stuff like that i've had that and um the thing that i could say that it's kept me afloat is what people i have around me you know there's two things i i, I want to say that are quotes that i think are very powerful that are not by me but i've heard which is you know the only thing that I regret or that we should regret is an opportunity to be kind that we missed. That's huge. Yeah. It's a, it's very fleeting moment and who, who I surround myself around, who I surround myself around really is who I am and the person that I'm going to become. Am I looking at this as a negative, as a, fixed mindset or am I looking at this as where's the opportunity in and I think that can really change how 
how we see things and it's changed again, how I've seen things. And I appreciate you saying that about my content because believe you me, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Sometimes we don't know, you know, I don't know. I put the content out. It's what I think I would want to see. I really am going with that guideline. Um, yes, definitely. Please follow me. I plan to put much more stuff on at train.space.com, which will be much more educational and just some fun stuff at FQ, which I'm sure uh, you guys have there or you could share as well. Yeah, we're hundred percent going to put this again. This will be on Spotify, all the other um, platforms and YouTube. Um, but as you mentioned, I, I definitely feel that we only scratch the surface on some of the things we want to kind of pick your brain with. So if that's something it. you would like to do in future, we'd love to have you on again. Cause I think we, this, we, we have so much more we'd want to ask you about, like you have no idea. So it'd be awesome. To I really appreciate that. Of it course, would, it would be, a, it would tr be a true blessing and an opportunity. You know, I've, I've really liked the idea of great minds talking together. Some of the things I've noticed in New York that we didn't have in Miami when it came to Equinox was that they were having great conversations in New York and Chicago as trainers. And I miss the ability of having connection with some of those guys. So I'm definitely open to continuing to opening up some subjects and things that are going on in our world and seeing if maybe we could help others get some insight or maybe not feel alone when they feel those kinds of struggles. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Khan, thank you so, thank awesome. you so much for your time, Freddie. We really appreciate it, man. Thanks, Thanks Freddie. Freddie. Pleasure to meet Thanks you. Thanks a lot, guys. It awesome. Take it easy. Take Thanks, care. Talk to you soon, man. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. That was pretty awesome. Freddie was a blast to have. That yeah, was a great, um, great conversation. I'm sorry my connection wasn't that hell? great. I know I you dipped out. I'm like, oh, that. shit. The host <laughs> laughed. Uh, me, David, are thinking, oh, no, I think he's a host yeah. now. Yeah, I made I David know. a co-host, but we'll, we'll see oh. what it ends up. <laughs> we'll see how it ends up. It was a very good, it was a very good uh, conversation. Uh, no and there was a lot that I wanted to speak about, including, I mean, he... It's interesting because the last episode we did, we were speaking about shoes and what kind of kicks to wear. And he brought, he brought it up. up the Feyus, bro. Those Feyus. Fuck, fuck those Nikes, bro. First of all, yeah, the Feyus weren't even in the conversation, right? It was like, I like Feyus. And no I mean, they're kind of like, they're like in the, at the end of the spectrum, kind of. Like I've seen Antoine wearing, wearing them. Wearing them. Yeah, right. Antoine, Antoine wears them, but now, now they're a lot more mainstream. Like I've seen really dope ads for them on like Instagram shit. Yeah, I cool. that's because Instagram cool. knows what you're looking at, though. That's why I don't, I don't trust Instagram. I've never looked them up. Somehow you have. <laughs> <laughs> but have you, have you, hey, let me ask you this, Angel. When you <laughs> were looking for Metcons the other day, was your feed on Instagram not just here are the other Metcons you could be looking at? Yeah, mine was. So it wasn't because I was using DuckDuckGo. Ah, uh, it thing. all goes back. It all goes that's back. It. I'm telling you, but 25, 25 bucks, right. bucks right. for right. perfect for a really good pair of phase. There you go. All right. We got it. That, that like was, a that was the other thing as well is I think Freddie does use Vivo barefoot mm -hmm. and I wanted, we'll, 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 we'll do it all the time. But I, cause I know yeah. you've asked, that was something you wanted to ask. Wasn't I it? wanted to ask about barefoot training, but my connection was so poor. I was like, let me just stick with what I got right now. And then I am out. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's cool that it did almost resurface right the the focus on how, what footwear to use when working out or when to move or when moving his analogy was really good as well i i think i've heard that before the hundred i've never heard of, that that was a hundred, really good one hundred dollar analogy hundred dollars a pair of hundred dollar shoes oh. with a 10 cent squat yep yeah, that's it yeah that's true you can have you can have the best sneakers you got the newest from aleos newest metcons and your and your squat look Try like, no <laughs> rep. I was gonna say, no. but it was good. Uh, it was right. very, it was a very constructive um, podcast. Very constructive episode. Yeah, no, I was glad we have him on. We'll have him. We'll have him on again soon. And you got, yeah, to our listeners, you should definitely check him out for the reasons I said. Where it's pretty, it's just very original. He's not. He is. I just think he's very straightforward to the point with trying to progress movement. And something again, I wanted to ask him was. We'll, we'll, we'll get into it, but I wanted to ask him a bit about when you have those conflicts or resistance to more um, more bodyweight movements as opposed to just loading things up, like external loads. So, but he he's very 
again, he does a lot of stuff with handstands and um, he's a very big on mobility. And just, if you guys ever see him do animal flow, it's like fucking magic. It's just so smooth. So, and like anyone who does a movement over time looks, it looks better. It looks more controlled, but like when someone, if someone sees me or a client sees me do animal flow, they're like, Oh, you look so good in my head. I'm like, yeah, it's not quite like Freddy though. Freddy is next fucking level. So you guys should definitely check him out. It's it's just pretty sick. You see his stuff on F. Wait, at F. F K U bed. I want to say. Yeah, F K U bed. B E D. Um yeah. But cool. All right, so we'll wrap it up, and awesome. we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, guys. Take it easy. Bye. Bye.